Hello, everybody, and here we are talking about Chapter 30 using the Cornell Note Strategy. So you read Chapter 30, and we talked about using Cornell Method. Um, my version is to add more images, color, um, and we don't have a summary section at the bottom of the page if you're used to seeing those elements. But you can still use this strategy to help organize your big ideas on the left-hand side of the page and the small details on the right side. We started Chapter 30 with the essential question, how does a country meet the challenges of a large and growing population? So then we talked about the basics of China, the fact that one out of every five people in the world is Chinese, and that obviously in a large and growing uh, nation, you have very important necessity of food, water, shelter. Uh, and food supply vital in a nation that's prone to drought and famine. And so considering China's geography, that's going to be very important in helping to understand the challenges of their population. Um, the nation is considered isolated geographically because of the mountains to the west, as well as the deserts to the west and north, and then additionally the ocean to the east. And um, so oftentimes in history, China was referred to as the Middle Kingdom because it was kind of between um, the lands to the west and the ocean to the east. Uh, now, in land area, it's approximately the same size as the United States. And um, if you were to take a profile of China, you would see that it is a giant slope. So while it is the same size as the United States, its profile is drastically different. Um, the United States is shaped more like a bowl with mountains on either side. But China is shaped more like a giant slope with the mountains um, as high as Mount Everest in the Himalayas to the west, to some of the northern plateaus, and then river basins which then flow out into the ocean to the east. Now because of these challenging geographic conditions, the majority of people are going to live on the eastern half of the country. So while it is the same size as the United States geographically, imagine putting um, all of those people on only half of the available land. Um, in addition to places for people, you also have to have room to grow food. So China um, was the first country to reach a billion people. And it did that in the 1980s. Uh, the beginning of Chapter 30 does use a lot of um, demographic language. And so they use terms like rate of natural increase, doubling time. And the most important thing to think about with those terms is that we're talking about natural increase. So we want to grow a population by having more children than um, people who die. And so as people are born and people die in a relatively stable country, those numbers will be approximately the same. But in a country that has a high rate of natural increase, you have a lot more people being born than people dying. So your, your population is continuing to grow, and that creates more people to feed, more people to educate, more people to find jobs for. The term doubling time is going to refer to the amount of time that it takes for a nation's population to double. Um, and that's just a benchmark that uh, demographers and, and people who study history and population, they look at that number um, to see how quickly a country is increasing in size. So um, that happens to be what we call an inverse relationship. When one goes up, the other one goes down. When one goes down, the other one goes up. And so an inverse relationship shows you that they are connected in, in opposites. So obviously the slower your country natural rate of increases, um, then the, the longer it's going to take for your population to double. So with China facing this um, challenge of population, one of the first plans that they came up with was to slow the population growth. So let's get a little bit of background, um, a little bit of history, and then we're going to talk about the what the solution is, the pros of that solution, and then the cons. And we'll follow that same pattern for all of our um, policies that we're going to be looking at here in Chapter 30. So plan one, slow population growth. Mao Zedong was the leader of China. He led the Communist Revolution in 1949 and led until his death in 1976. And so he created the um, this belief in uh, large families. He felt that lots of people create a strong country, create um, this boost into the industrial era. So 1958, um, we're after World War II when technology is growing in other parts of the world and Mao has a plan that he wants to push China into um, a technological 
it's an industrial center. Um, so more people make them work harder. We're going to focus on steel production, food production. Um, however, his plan backfires as there are droughts and famine. Um, many people end up starving through his uh, program of the Great Leap Forward, um, and also the products that they're able to produce were very low quality. Um, people were throwing forks and spoons and bicycle parts into homemade kilns in their backyards um, and trying to create strong steel. Um, it just doesn't work that way. So the Great Leap Forward was not successful uh, in terms of creating a modern industrial powerhouse in China. Um, but what it did do was create a large and growing population. So one of the solutions after Mao um, was gone and out of power, the one of the solutions was to limit the number of children that, that people could have. And if we could limit families and family size, then that would slow the population growth and there would be fewer people um, in the country to have to take care of. So um, in evaluating this solution, um, we need to look at both the pros and the cons. So obviously some of the benefits of having only one child is you do lower your growth. Um, your country is going to not have as many people. Um, with fewer people, you have less competition for food, water, jobs. Um, there are also impacts on health. And if mothers are having fewer babies, um, then they also are able to stay healthier because um, pregnancy is a stress on uh, the human body. There are also difficulties that can arrive during childbirth, and it can... Um, result in the loss of both children and mothers. So having fewer children creates less of that um, stress. Um, it also allows you to have more money to spend uh, because there are fewer children to divide the, the profits um, or the money that you earn as a family. There's fewer people to, to divide that out by. Um, so those are the pros of the one-child policy. Um, some of the challenges are the limit to your personal freedom. Um, in a communist country, there's already an um, understanding that your personal freedom is often second to the common good. Um, however, there is a growing desire for people to have more independence. And this limiting of my personal rights to have children, we talked in class about how many of us are the oldest or only child. And if we aren't, under this policy, we might not exist. And what would that do to um, our families, to our siblings, to our community, um, for there to be less people around? Um, also, in China, there is a cultural tradition of boys carrying on the family name, which resulted in um, early years of more females being given up for adoption um, when we couldn't tell what the sex of the child was. Um, with modern technology, we are able to tell that. Um, and so there are times when girl children are um, aborted um, or, again, given up for adoption. This created, in the next generation, a challenge of an uneven population distribution and having a larger percentage of males, um, which then, when you go to create your own family, um, there's a shortage of females to have as wives and mothers for the next generation. Um, additionally, this put a stress on the family because there were fewer people, um, fewer children, left to take care of aging parents, which as a cultural custom in China, um, it is the children that take care of aging parents. So there's a cultural shift that happens when you have to resort to um, a nursing home or um, some retirement facility in order for uh, older people to get the care that they need in their later years. So as we move on, another challenge of a large and growing population is meeting the needs of energy. And not only energy, but um, energy that does not create the kind of pollution that we currently have. Um, so plan two to help with uh, the growing population was to create clean energy. China does have the second largest consumption of energy in the world. Only the United States uses more energy. But the United States also has developed alternative technologies. We know that currently burning coal is going to create smoke with toxic chemicals. Those mix in the air, creating acid rain, creating pollution. Um, and China does burn more coal than any other country in the world. So what can we do? Create a hydroelectric power plant. Um, we know that water 
um, is a renewable resource. It's in the water cycle, and so it is um, one of those resources that we can continue to use over and over again. Um, and use, harnessing the power of water flowing over or through um, a, a structure like a dam doesn't create um, the same kind of pollution. Definitely no toxic chemicals being released in the air. And so if we can create hydroelectric power, then that's going to create new energy, but also do so in a clean and sustainable way. So there's an area of China that's called the Three Gorges, and it's along the Yangtze River. It is um, going to become the world's largest dam. It was started in 1993, and it took a very long time for it to be completed. Um, they're still completing some of the final pieces. So um, as this dam was being built, it was going to create a 400 mile long reservoir. A reservoir is the water that backs up behind the dam, creating a lake. We have a similar system in our Hoover Dam. Lake Mead is created by the water that's held back by the dam. Um, some people are calling this China's new Great Wall because of the um, monumental task of creating this humongous structure um, and how it's going to change the landscape. So what are some of the benefits and some of the challenges of this solution to provide clean energy? Uh, well, one of the benefits is obviously this idea that it is renewable. Um, and some other things that were mentioned was this idea of flood control. Because a river is a natural uh, feature on Earth, then it is subject to the forces of nature. And occasional floods do create a lot of damage and destruction. So by using this um, dam, you can actually control the water in a, in a more strategic way, uh, hopefully reducing random death and destruction um, due to flooding. Uh, additionally, you'll be able to improve shipping because there were parts of the Yangtze River that were very narrow or very shallow, um, and by creating this dam just and system of locks that can help move larger ships further along the river, you can improve shipping, making transportation um, cheaper, making um, goods that you're selling easier to transport back and forth um, along the river. So those are the benefits. Um, some of the challenges are the fact that along this Three Gorges site, there were hundreds of archaeological finds, um, old cities, relics, ruins from uh, hundreds of years of Chinese history. Uh, as the reservoir fills up, those will become um, lost underwater. Also, the people who lived along the Three Gorges River um, would be forced to relocate. Uh, we talked about eminent domain in the United States and the fact that the country is provided um, or is, is required to provide what is considered fair uh, market value if they take away your land. Um, and while some Chinese families were given money for their land, it wasn't what they would have tried to get if they tried to sell it on their own. Also, the challenge of starting over and relocating hundreds of towns and villages. Um, this is also going to greatly change the ecosystem. And as water is in a place where water was not before, um, then the animals that lived along that waterway are now having to move out. Um, it's also going to change the habitat for the river dolphin and the paddlefish, which are some of the endangered species in that part of the world. Parts of the Three Gorges Dam also happen to be built along an earthquake fault line. Um, and so there is always the question of whether or not that um, the potential of an earthquake and the impact of a crack or, um, or a challenge to the actual construction of the dam itself, releasing that humongous amount of water and, and the disastrous flood that could result as a part of that. So the third plan had to do with creating enough jobs and economic growth to support this growing number of people. Um, so there was a plan um, while Mao was alive to um, <clears throat> to use a communist uh, economy economic strategy of uh, using the government to decide the price, the products, who could work, what the wages would be, um, and his cultural revolution was to create a society where everyone would be equal. Um, what this in effect did um, was similar to the um, the Soviet Union, where we saw instead of equality, we saw an abuse of power, um, censorship, imprisonment, um, many people um, leaving farms, uh, leaving factories, and um, the loss of work and production that that actually created was uh, very detrimental to the growth of China. 
So again, after Mao is gone, the solution was to create special economic zones to try and bring in um, trade with other countries. However, uh, many other countries looked at China's policies and said, that's not where we would like to do business. Thank you very much. And so what China had to do was create these special economic zones, which would, would, which would provide freedom to these international countries, international um, companies, um, and yet not change the overall structure of China's communist economy. So um, in an SEV, in your special economic zone, um, companies can come in from other parts of the world. They do not have to follow the same laws. They do not have to follow the same government um, bureaucracy or paperwork that's required by Chinese companies in those places. So this creates jobs. Companies are coming to China. They are investing in um, buildings, providing jobs to um, Chinese migrant workers. That's then allowing those migrant workers to send money home to families living in rural areas, improving their standard of living, and these are all benefits for China. Um, some of the cons are that it is also creating what's known as an income gap. The, the wealthier people are staying wealthy, whereas um, a larger number of people who do not have access to wealth um, remain poor. And this idea of a floating population of people who are just trying to find the best job rather than staying in a place and um, building a life there, this creates the potential for crime, for frustration, for um, people who don't stay and invest in their community. So what does this have to do with the rest of the world? Well, China does happen to be the largest, most populated country in the world um, currently. However, India is um, expected to overtake that uh, rate with their current rate of natural increase. The other countries that are very populated in the world are Indonesia, Brazil, and the United States. Those are the top five representing half of the world's population. And so as population grows. With health care, people are living longer. Um, infant mortality is down. So as people are living longer, population is increasing. We're expected to reach 9 billion people relatively quickly. So what are you, um, what are you able to do, um, and how can we convince countries that still have high population, or high population growth, um, how can we convince them to help manage this so that there is more food, resources, education, um, and the, the other challenges that we had talked about earlier. Um, one is the amount of money that is spent on health care. And we know that as infant mortality goes down, life expectancy goes up. That's, again, an inverse relationship. Um, and we also know that with more money spent on health care, there can be better family planning. And people can decide whether they want to spend um, money on five children, whether they would rather have two. Um, there's better family planning options. We also talked about the impact of educating women, and the more time women spend in school, the less time they have to start families. Um, often if they focus on a career, they will choose to have fewer children because of the time um, necessary. Um, and overall, there are benefits that you can spend more money on children when there are fewer of them to go around. There's more money available for health care, um, and in a country that has good rates of natural increase, um, you can attract trade, business, increase your economic growth, and have a higher standard of living for your people.